Welcome back to Andy Kim's International Finance Week 1 portion of the lecture, Chapter 1. Uh, I told you before that I'm going to digress a little bit about the history of international finance. Um, this is the one. So if you don't like it, you can skip to the next video. Uh, I'm going to tell you something more about the historical part of it, I so told you. Yeah, you can think about globalization as kind of a wave, okay? They call it globalization wave. Um, major trends and developments, waves of globalization have been there. They say there was a first wave, second wave, and third wave. Um, right now, my question becomes what's next, right? We had COVID-19 and then the crisis over there. But what's going to happen into the globalization next uh, going, going forward, right? Um, but even before that, what was there previously, before 1870, wasn't there any globalization before? And the answer is not really. There were some significant movement among the different people of the uh, different continents, right? Uh, Asia and Europe and, and Africa and then all different places, right? Globalization waves comes and goes. That's something I have to tell you. And then on the timeline, 1870 to First World War, there was a first wave. That was the period of imperialism. And then let's say fair capitalism period uh, or robber baron age uh, in America. Uh, and there was a bipolarization of income. We're going to talk about that later. And then there was a first world war and then second world war. Um, during this period over here. And that was the period where the communism and uh, broke out uh, in getting get more popular, okay? Why? Because of the bipolarization of income in the previous period, right? Um, and then uh, uh, Russia and then, you know, all these countries got into the sentiment of, or the political movement of communism. And then the capitalist world had to be, you know, Ill alert a lot more after the destruction of uh, Second World War, it, the tension between these two different worlds got even higher. You know that it is called the Cold War, right? Not, I mean, of, of course, there was a hot war in Korean Peninsula about this uh, ideology. Uh, we Korean people had to suffer a lot. Two million people died out of it. Anyway, but of course, 16 different, 16 different countries also suffered a lot. But Afterwards, there was a second wave of globalization to, you know, uh, at least among these uh, capitalist world. Let's pursue some prosperity instead of um, competing too much against each other, like in a killing manner, right? Uh, second wave of globalization happened under the protection of called the Bre Bretton Woods system. That was not sustainable, actually. Um, we're going to go through that Triffin's dilemma or uh, paradox kind of things, uh, concepts later on. So after Nixon doctrine, right, um, 1971, those second wave broke down. They could not sustain a budgetary reason in America and then currency value. It has direct implicate, I mean, directly related to FX, uh, uh, right? And then uh, there were some oil crisis, and then after 1989, right? That was the right after Seoul Olympic, by the way, Seoul Olympic 1988, and then the fall of Berlin Wall, right? Um, the the communist world collapsed, and then the only survivor turned out to be the capitalist world. Um, Afterwards, there was unbreakable uh, movement towards globalization and capitalism, right? Um, and then people got more and more, much more open to, you know, uh, working in other countries and moving and doing business in other countries like this, right? Um, that's the third wave of globalization. And then there was bipart uh, bipolarization again um, in incomes, right? You may wonder, isn't the bipolarization of income common all across human history? But I say not that much. Even when you look at the income difference between the CEO and then average workers in that com company, right? The difference between these two, 
or the income difference between the bankers and then the common workers in the production facilities, right? That wage gap was not this drastic in Cold War period until 1980s, right? Um, the U.S. data tells us about it. If you don't believe me, go ahead and uh, you know Google search Thomas Philippon's uh, in New York University, right? Um, that was has been you know like that. More egalitarian period was there. I told you Cold War period. Why the capitalist country? They have been afraid that the communist threat is non-trivial, so that we have to be more egalitarian in the first place. Once the communist country died out, well, who can kill us? Just so be it. And then just, yeah, ever since 1989, that bipolarization has been accelerating in an unbreakable fashion, right? Um, so that has been going on. What's the consequence? Well, there were some people, a lot, not just uh, some people, majority of the people, 99% or 90% or depending on how you want to call it, right? Um, those people felt disadvantaged, okay? And then against those people who are, you know, global elites, um, Wall Street bankers or CEOs or top talented guys or plutocrats, you know, whichever way you want to call it, right? The income gap is too big. Uh, and then they are, those elites are, living in my country and taking away my job they were afraid they get got afraid and concerned more about it and then naturally those sentiment against this globalization grew higher and higher so that there was a brexit and trump got elected in the u.s and you saw the disaster happening right but the basic sentiment uh behind that still sustains Okay, and then free trade, how much do we have to allow? And then job export, all these kind of things, okay, has been a big concern, right? Even though now Biden is in the power in the administration, um, we believe that, you know, many people believe that uh, uh, moving away from China, okay, or stopping those job exports to China will be there, okay, will be there. Um, regardless of the regime, okay, which administration the U.S. has, right, their movement away from China or that kind of things is inevitable, unstoppable, okay? Um, plus, we have COVID-19. So what's next is a big, big question that everybody has, right? No answer, no clear current answer to, for that, but everybody is touching upon the parts of the elephant, elephants and then try to infer something out of it right now in the dark. Okay, good. Uh, globalization has been there actually, you know, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, even, you know, Korea and then India, there were a lot of um, ocean-based trades, it seems like. My family, Kim family, right? We say Kim He Kim, right? Kim He area we originated from. Um, we say our ancestor, uh, mother side ancestor, came from India, Ayodhya. You see Ayutta, right? Country over there. There was a trade between these two countries. There were alliances going on. Believe it or not, that's our legend, right? Or myth, whichever you call it. And at least it tells us that there must have been some. Uh, active trading going on between among these uh, side of the Asia. Now getting to Europe, right? Um, go, if you look at the Roman Empire, right? Well, what's the difference between Europe and Asia? Well, in Asia, in, you know, at the center, you have a big country called China. In Europe, at the center of the, you know, Europe, you have no country but the whole Mediterranean Ocean, right? Chi Chung He. It's like a ocean that is in the middle of the lands, right? China is a middle kingdom, middle of somewhere. You have an ocean versus country. Um, okay, Pax Romana was there, right? Uh, and then the Middle Ages, right? 
Black Death and Mon Mongolian Invasion has been there, but there has, a, has been a lot of trades between uh, among these different countries there. Interactions has been there, and then the Silk Road was there so that the uh, Asia and Europe ha have been trading a lot. And then the Fugar family in Europe was big, and Medici must be familiar name for you. Medici family in Italia. Um, you see they were prospering thanks to this trade across this uh, Silk Road or Ocean Ways, uh, trading the spices. Spice like what? Pepper, not salt and pepper, but pepper from this uh, Indonesian part, right? And then a lot of uh, cinnamons and all these kind of spices, right? And then these uh, tea was also a good subject to trade. Whether you pronounce it cha or tea, right? Comes from the same Chinese character. They pronounce it differently, right? In Asia or Korea part of Asia, we call it, pronounce it cha. In Japan, they call it ocha. And Chinese, cha, right? But the Fujianese or Hokkien, the pronunciation is te. Ta, te. I don't know how that translated, converted in that way, but te or te, a, te. That's um, bakute kind of things in in Malaysia a language, right? Or Singapore, right? That te became t, meaning the same thing as cha or chai, right? And then that was traded a lot and throughout Renaissance or the recent, uh, you know, more modern ages. And then the absolute monarchy and the med uh, med mercantilism uh, was there. And then they were trying to expand their empire somehow. And monarchs, they wanted to get some more resources from their colonies. Geographical discovery was there also. Tried to, you know, Columbus tried, tried it to reach India and believed that he reached India until he died, right? Uh, turns out this is America. This is America. And then, um, with that, you know, Christopher Columbus and then a lot of traders were working out there, um, expanding into this, uh, you know, colonies. And together with it, there was industrial revolution in Britain like this. And then you see a lot of uh, new engines. How do you call it? The steam engines brought about a lot of uh, technological innovation, especially in the wool industry or textile industry. Right, so with this uh, technological innovation in Great Britain, right, they were selling a lot of uh, textiles, woolen textiles, cheaply. And then the Rothschild family made their fortune by importing it from Britain, from Manchester, and then bringing it to continental Europe and selling it expensively. Um, so that's how they, you know, got uh, famous and then got so much money to s be able to uh, become a banker in London and so that they would be able to support those uh, uh, military funding for uh, Wellington, right? In the Napoleonic War, you see in the mid uh, meantime, there was a French Revolution, right? Allons enfants de la patrie I don't know how I pronounced it correctly or not, but I hope it is right. Anyway, so that French Revolution brought, you know, this uh, a lot of drastic political uncertainty in continental Europe. All different monarchs were like in the danger uh, with uh, about Napoleon and then their civil, you know, uh, soldiers were just uh, triumphant and then they were like expanding into different side of Europe right a lot of political uncertainty involving this war right was there there was a you know a battle of Waterloo that is very famous you know that there was a Wellington versus Napoleon and this kind of things right different countries and then different bankers got involved in that supporting those different sides right um, that global financial world, okay, is involved in this political sense as well, right? That's something we have to notice. And then there, after, you know, uh, the Napoleon went down, um, there came, uh, how do you say, the concert of Europe in 19th century. That is 
복고 반동, like a uh, react, how do you say, the more conservative reaction against this French Revolution, um, and then supporting those uh, monarchs, and then uh, suppressing those democratic movement, right? Uh, Metternich of Vienna was there, uh, and the major player, uh, and politically. But um, behind that Metternich, there was a banker uh, family called Rothschild, right? Spread across different uh, five different cities in Europe, London, Paris, and Frankfurt, and uh, Naples, and then Vienna, right? They were supporting those uh, monarchs and then concerting, right? Um, so that there will be more, how do you say, globally less troublesome. Um, they were trying to stay away from nationalistic movement. Why? Because for, for Rothschild's perspective, they are Jewish bankers, uh, and then the Jewish people were spread in different countries, right? So that different countries' nationalistic movement against e the, the other country will bring more trouble to the ethnic group, the ethnic group Jewish people maybe, or other ethnic groups that are spread in those two different countries. Okay, for example, if Korea and Japan become much more nationalistic and try to fight against each other, those people who are Korean Japanese or Japanese Korean people, they will be emotionally and uh, politically and economically troubled as much. Right? Um, same idea. For these people, uh, Rose, Rothschild family, they did not want this kind of uh, uh, nationalistic uh, movement um, so that they were trying to pursue some more global harmony, harmonization. Um, so that's how they try to influence the politics in, in, uh, in a manner uh, that is not visible. Okay. Um, anyway, so that was the period of globalization in their own way, right? And then there came Bismarck and Proisen in 1871 um, because you know they wanted to you know with I told you Deutsche Bank was established in 1871. This is a time when the German people rose up and then they said we need our own country instead of having 200 different countries split. Right? Um, let's gather together and then increase the power of it and it became more nationalistic. Right? Um, and then there, there was an uh, imperialistic movement and nation states establishment movement going on. And then the, the more establishment with uh, Preussen, with Bismarck's uh, blood and iron strategy, right? There was a conflict between uh, France and German Empire like that. The major part of the, re uh, the region was Alsace and Lorraine because they had um, a lot of iron ore, right? You see the reddish, right? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, Alsace, that's a very beautiful place. I went in Colmar area, yeah, the, perhaps the most beautiful place I've ever seen, right? Like a fairy tale town, right? Um, but it had those iron ore, and then these guys wanted to have that iron ore because they had a coal mine behind their, uh, you know, in their region, right, in their territory. If they mix it together, they could build a strong uh, steel manufacturer to become a strong power, industry powerhouse in Europe. So that's, that was their uh, ambition, right? And then with this, with this nationalistic sentiment going on, the conflict among these two, between these two empires was not helping globalization. Uh, eventually, they ended up fighting like crazy in uh, First World War, right? Um, that was stopping the first globalization movement. And then U.S., how about that, right? In the new uh, continent, right? Uh, new world. U.S. after Civil War, well, that was the Robert Barron age. Um, uninterrupted, let's say, fair capitalism. Yagyeonggukka in Korean terminology, right? free capitalist market uh, and then the government's role has to be minimal so that the free uh, market will you know let the invisible hand work for you okay uh, adam smith idea okay classical idea was enforced but the thing was 
as the government was not getting, uh, you know, becoming, you know, not functioning any at, at all, I mean, not functioning too much, um, the rich got richer, the poorer got poorer. Um, so John D. Rockefeller that you see over here, the oil king, J.P. Morgan, banking king. Um, essentially, they became monopolistic power. 98% of oil, and then, you know, this guy, we're going to talk about J.P. Morgan's power later. Andrew Carnegie, steel mill, right, steel. And then uh, Vanderbilt, and then Guggenheim, all these guys, like the railroads, monopoly kind of guys. Um, so all kinds of things happen over there, much more dramatic than we, uh, we, we expect as Korean or non-American people. Um, what we have experienced in Korea over the last uh, 40, uh, 50 years, they experienced it in America in, during this period, right? Jebol can do anything. They were doing it. Um, anyway, so after the First World War and the Second World War took place, you know that, right? The globalization, you cannot imagine that, right? It was basically no globalization, everything halted, Holocaust and all terrible things happened there. We don't want to even remember that. Um, and then, and then, bipolarization of income and class struggle has was there, right? And then there was communist revolution going on everywhere in the world, right? Um, inside the empires and then outside the empires as well. So, regardless of where you belong to, you you faced all these kind of communist sentiment going on there during this period. Uh, Karl Marx, and then who do you see? Uh, Stalin and Lenin in Russia, and then Deng Xiaoping, and then Che Guevara in, in South America. And who are these people over here? One is Kim Il-sung in North Korea, and the other is, uh, who is it? Vietnam, okay? Ho Chi Minh, right? They were communist guys uh, trying to, you know, you know, do something about it. Anyway, so there was this kind of movement during this period, and uh, Second World War finished, right? And then afterwards, there was second wave of globalization, um, which was basically uh, supported by the Bretton Woods system. That Bretton Woods place is over here in the picture. That's America. Uh, that was a conference held in America, right? Um, some resort. Right, and then Bretton Woods Agreement. Yeah, we're gonna talk a lot more about it. This uh, financial system in chapter two. Um, Keynes, you see it over here, him over here, and over there as well. Here's my two cents of uh, amateur historian perspective in global finance. Right. So uh, after Second World War, right. Um, unlike the uh, unlike what they did after First World War. They did some generous plan to revive and reconstruct the whole European and Japanese uh, country, okay? Why? Why didn't they leave those loser countries into the uh, ruin, uh, just like what they did in First World War? Because First World War, because of the damage, repairment, and then all those debts related to the war, right? Uh, imposed on those loser countries, right? Um, Hitler came, was elected by their people. Hyperinflation took off in that country, right? And then it had unintended consequence. All disastrous, even worse. And the Holocaust and the, you know, uh, Japanese invasion even more, by the way, in Korea. Uh, or, or Asian continent, right? Um, but something unwanted really happened. So this time, let's help them reconstruct all together, right? Whether you are a loser country or winner country, it doesn't matter. Let's reconstruct it together. As long as you belong to this capitalist world. So the even more important reason is you don't want Germany and then Japanese uh, people going to Stalinist communist regime. Remember that was the period of Cold War. So the Europe and the United States, their biggest concern was how to 
contain or isolate this uh, Soviet Union's uh, influence, right? The best way to do that is to make this Germany and then Japan become rich again by joining this capitalist world together, right? That was the key idea of Marshall Plan and then the idea of the uh, strategy of containment by George Kennan, right, in 1950s and 60s, right? Um, so as a result, global trading increased in the Western Hemisphere, as you see it, uh, but not so in communist world, right? Socialist world or whichever way you want to say it. And then you see Toyota and then Porsche and Sony and all of this, right? If you think about, you know, aren't these two countries the enemies of the United States in Second World War? And how come, right? They were supportive like this. And now you see why, right? Um, and then... The test case about this Cold War, right? As long as you belong to capitalist world, you become rich. And if you belong to that socialist world, you become beggar. Um, the test case, natural experiment happened in Korean Peninsula, South Korea versus North Korea. If you don't believe me, go ahead and read um, Why Nations Fail, the book by uh, Asemoglu. Asemoglu in MIT, right? Anyway, so that's that until 1970s, right? Marshall Plan and then Bretton Woods supported second wave of globalization. But it could not sustain because it was heavily dependent on the US economy and US budget deficits. And then you cannot sustain uh, enormous budget deficits without devaluing your currency. And that uh, Triffin's dilemma is there, and you're going to study that part, okay? And U.S. government deficit due to heavy spending in Vietnam War and the trade deficits from Japan and Europe was there, okay? Um, Nixon doctrine happened, and then Smithsonian Agreement also happened, and then that meant a collapse of Bretton Woods system. Essentially, the gold exchange, uh, U.S. dollar-based gold exchange system collapsed right uh, we're going to talk more about it in chapter two and then a uh, uh, couple of oil shocks happened during the 70s and 80s and then afterwards there was a third wave of globalization that was a time when the soviet union was went down and then the berlin wall fell down okay unification reunification of these two countries uh, of uh, the fall of Berlin Wall and China and India and the capitalist world uh, you know, became the you know uh, capitalist and then privatization in China and Eastern Hemisphere uh, took place and, and that it meant a triumph of capitalism with no rivaling system at all. If you don't have check and balance from other regimes then you become what? Breakless go 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 right? Uh, encouraging in inequality as incentives. Of course, how much of an inequality do we need is a big subject, right? If, if we are living in a complete equal world, like in communist world, we're gonna, you know, nobody's gonna work, right? Uh, no efficiency uh, in the economy, not good. You become more productive because there's inequality and then there's a chance that you can achieve higher position or a higher outcome later on. That drives you. Inequality drives you to work hard, but to a certain degree, but not to the extreme degree. Okay, there. Where is that optimal point? We don't know. That's what the scholars are looking for. Anyway, uh, Deng Xiaoping, you see it over here, the Chinese leader. He said, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, so long as it catches mouse right? right? We don't need to stick to that communist idea too much, right? That's it. Now, major trends and developments. Emergence of globalized the financial market has been there uh, uh, throughout this uh, history. And then emergence of the euro as a global currency has been there. Uh, and then the trade liberalization and economic integration happened uh, through this uh, period. And then privatization um, took place 
especially after 1989. And global financial crisis took place uh, recently, 10 years ago. And then Europe's sovereign debt crisis happened afterwards. And then most recently, Brexit, um, Trump and anti-globalization movement um, started to do uh, take place. And then we have cor coronavirus 19. Right. Um, so next slide, uh, next set of lecture, uh, we are going to talk about uh, in more detail about these uh, emergence of globalized financial markets. So thanks for watching.